what are the common symptoms that a woman may experience through the menstrual cycle and when in the menstrual cycle are those symptoms typically experienced? Yeah, so there's a wide range of symptoms. There's people who go through their menstrual cycle without really noticing anything. They're, they really don't have much pain with menstruation. They don't have really any emotional symptoms that might change. They go on pretty fine. And then Is that the minority of people? Um, you know, I think that yeah, to be completely asymptomatic, yes, but definitely there are. So I think it's just, you know, it's funny because when I was on book tour, I had a couple people stand up and say, you know, am I like weird for for not having any symptoms? So I I've now included that in all of my discussion to kind of go through the range because I want people to appreciate there's a range. Then um, for most people, the follicular phase, the first part of the cycle, tends to be pretty stable from a, from a symptom standpoint. We'll talk about menstruation at the end. With ovulation, um, there can be pain for some people. Some people can have ovulatory pain. And we actually believe that's due to muscle spasm in the ovary. Um, people used to think it was due to like the egg bursting out, but it doesn't burst out. It's not under pressure. It's kind of like the sac dissolves and it just kind of comes out. So, um, so we believe it's actually due to muscle spasm. And that's called middle schmerz, uh, which is, um, I think, German for middle pain. I was really saddened to find out that there wasn't a Dr. Middle Schmertz. I thought there would have been, but no, it's, it's, it's not from that. That's during ovulation. Yeah, that's true. So it's ovulatory yeah. pain. Yeah, it actually happens right before ovulation. Right. I'm clearly very ignorant here because I had always assumed that the pain was experienced during the bleeding. Well, that's, we're going to get to that. That's another pain. So that's dysmenorrhea. That's painful periods. So I'm kind of working through. So with ovulation or right before ovulation, you can get pain and that's middle schmerz, and that is from muscle spasm, and that's due to release of prostaglandins with ovulation. Then another symptom people can have in the luteal phase due to the progesterone is PMS, PMS types of symptoms. So that could be bloating, it could be mood swings, it could be headache, it you know, could be a, a food cravings, a wide variety of things, sleep disturbance. And then with menstruation, there are a couple of things that can happen. So people can get menstrual migraines, that's actually due to the withdrawal of estrogen. So when those estrogen levels drop that second time, that can actually trigger migraines for some people. So that, you know, menstrual migraines, everybody doesn't get them, but certainly some people do. So why would that trigger migraines in one person, but then not the next? Million dollar question. Complex genetics and environment, multifactorial. How about that? Uh, well, that's a gap that you just left a jar <laughs> I just, and I have a supplement, $79 that you can right? buy for that. You do. <laughs> seventy nine ninety nine is, yeah, it's called menstrual max. <laughs> um, anyway, so, and then we get to menstrual pain. So menstrual pain is due to the withdrawal of prostaglandin, the withdrawal of progesterone which releases prostaglandins. Prostaglandins are the things like if you cut yourself, you release prostaglandins, that's what hurts. So the prostaglandins and you get release of nitrous oxide and all these other like inflammatory chemicals. So you get the pain. So prostaglandins themselves can amp up pain as they are sort of what we call algesic substances. But then you get significant, a decrease in a blood flow to the uterine muscle. You can get severe cramping. And if you think about it, you know, if you've had a really bad Charlie horse in your calf, right? You know, a bad muscle cramp can really hurt. So think about you getting this really intense pressure and this intense squeezing, you know, that is to push the blood out. It's also to compress the blood vessels to stop the bleeding, right? So it's an important part of the process. And it's a pretty significant pressure that's generated. It can be as much as 120 millimeters of mercury. It's really a lot of pressure. So it can be really, really painful. And obviously there's some people who are more sensitive to prostaglandins than others. And there's genetic probably differences in receptors and other things that can make people have, have more pain or less pain. And then there's also menstrual diarrhea, which can be due to the prostaglandins. And about 12% of people can get that. So there's a whole bunch of things. You wrote about, I think in your book, you said that was something you personally oh, yeah. experienced. Yeah, yeah, I, I had, I always say you said terrible menstrual diarrhea, but anyways, it had to be like, well, it doesn't need the qualifier terrible. It's pretty bad. Yeah, so it was a real, and I'd never heard, none of my friends talked about it. Does it swing the other way as well to 
constipation? Some people can get constipation. I mean, the body's weird. It's just it hasn't read the manual. It doesn't care about the manual, you know. And I think, you know, probably in 50 years, we're going to find out, or maybe not 50, it's just a guess. You know, we're going to be able to say, oh, well, you know, your receptor A alpha for this is, you know, your homozygous for this mutation, or you've got this enzyme in. And we're going to find out all these reasons. Like, for example, about 10% of people who take drugs like ibuprofen or naproxen for painful periods, drugs that block prostaglandins, they don't do anything for them, but they should because they block prostaglandins. And I'm not talking about people who have other reasons, like maybe endometriosis or another condition, but it seems like some people are resistant to those medications. We don't know why. You know, maybe in 10 years time, we're going to find out there's an enzyme. Ibuprofen. I think you wrote a blog about, was it on TikTok? Was there a trend on TikTok where people were suggesting you can take ibuprofen or Jello <laughs> to stop your period? Yeah, you can take- Is that a, a good idea? I don't, you know, take a high dose of ibuprofen and Jello. Like, where does this come from? As in taking them together? I, well, I guess like a, sh- a shot, I don't know. Like make it, you mix the Jello up and drink it, like the water. And I, it's like, how do people really- Anyway, so no. So why would you want to do that? Well, because of, because someone's experiencing pain? Uh, mostly because you maybe you're going away for the weekend, and you don't have your period. And you can take hormones for that. So you don't have to there's other ways to do it. Um, but it, it won't stop your period. What it can do is it can reduce your flow. So if you take a, an appropriate dose of ibuprofen or naproxen, and especially if you can start the day before your period, you can reduce your flow on average by 20 to 30%. Do you want to be doing that? Like, is there any downsides to reducing the flow? No. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Less blood loss is good. Um, so the, there's not like a an amount of blood that has to come out. The bleeding stops and the bleeding stops. It's it doesn't like, affect that turnover that you were talking about no. earlier. I tell people, you know, it's not a great analogy, but think about a bleeding nose. The bleeding nose stops and the bleeding nose stops. It's not like there's more blood that needs to come out. You've stopped the you've stopped mm-hmm. the inflammation, the injury that's allowing the blood to come out. So so yeah, so yeah, lots of people want to have less bleeding. Menstrual pads are expensive. It's a hassle to change menstrual cups, all these things. So you periods are optional. You don't have to have them at all if you don't want to. So yeah, so it's a good, it's a good tool. It doesn't work for everybody. Um, but a lot of people, there are people who don't want to take hormones and they say, well, wow, if I can take something just for three or four days a month and that makes my period lighter, great. Periods are optional. We're yeah. going to come back to that. Uh, I just, I want to double back here. Uh, menstrual diarrhea, mm-hmm. I just realized. So is there anything that, that someone can do for that? Because that sounds like something that could be uh, embarrassing. It could you know, just affect someone's ability to kind of navigate their day to day. Yeah. I once was in New York and spent the whole day. We were at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I spent the whole day in the bathroom. Every time I'd leave, I have to go back. That's not fun. It was not fun. I was 20. I was really sucked. I was in New York and I was just, I basically had to go from store to store to use bathrooms. It was awful. So, so I, anybody out there suffering with it, I'm very empathetic. So yeah, um, ibuprofen medications like that, but I didn't know that at the time because I thought there was just something wrong with me. Right all of this is kind of more of the physical manifestation or physical symptoms. What about emotional symptoms or changes in one's kind of psychological state through the menstrual cycle? Well, we have to be very careful how we talk about that because, you know, we don't ever want to position, you know, somebody as being lesser because of their menstrual cycle or less competent or anything like that. But definitely uh, during the luteal phase with the release of the hormone uh, progesterone, some people can have PMS symptoms. Uh, You know, so there is a big spectrum. A lot of people might have some bloating, feel like they're retaining some fluid. Many people might notice food cravings. Some people, again, sleep disturbance, other types of things. And for some people, it can be a massive trigger for depression, that they can have really significant depressive issues, you know, in the week or so before their period. And so PMS and premenstrual dysphoric disorder, which is essentially thought of as a more severe version. What is PMS? Uh, premenstrual, uh, premenstrual syndrome. So you can have premenstrual symptoms, which are, you know, not enough to really sort of, they're there, but they're not particularly bothersome. You just kind mm-hmm. of notice them. Then there's PMS, which is kind of more of a constellation, and maybe there's more impact on your activities of daily living. Mm. And is that a diagnosis? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So we think, you know, if you look at kind of menstrual symptoms, Yeah, maybe 70 to 80% of people get some type of symptom, you know, like bloating, food cravings, that type of thing. Then maybe 20% have PMS 
and maybe 2% have premenstrual dysphoric disorder, which is the more severe version. Uh, and the thing that is the hallmark is that these symptoms can't start before ovulation because they're related to progesterone. So triggers ovulation or sometime after and ends with the end of the menstrual cycle, with menstruation. So by the time the period is over, those symptoms need to be gone. People need to feel that they are completely symptom-free from these symptoms during their follicular phase. What are the best things that someone can do or explore if they're experiencing a considerable amount of pain, be it during the period phase or ovulation? Well, so we would treat ovulation pain and period pain different because they're different things. Um, most people with ovulation pain, they'll be managed fine with taking some non anti-inflammatory medications and knowing when to time it can be helpful. If it's very bothersome for a small percentage of people, you can take medications to stop ovulation, like hormonal contraception. So that could be an option. Uh, the For pain during menstruation, so that's a whole gamut of things. So we need to know if we think this is run-of-the-mill period pain, meaning it's just the pain people get with periods. And I don't mean the word just to downplay the significance, but just to imply that that's the only cause. Versus period pain that could be related to a condition like endometriosis or adenomyosis or maybe large fibroids. So we consider the first one primary dysmenorrhea, meaning it's just bad luck of the draw, maybe something to do with your enzymes, maybe something to do with how much prostaglandins you produce, who knows, but bad periods. The other is secondary dysmenorrhea, painful periods. Painful periods do do something else. And we're much more suspicious of it being due to something else if your periods have always been painful from the very get-go. So if when you were 12, you got your period and they were awful from the beginning, we'd be more concerned about that because when you first start menstruating, you don't ovulate regularly at all. In fact, your first year or so, you may only ovulate once or twice. It's much less common. But you need ovulation to have primary dysmenorrhea because you have to have withdrawal of progesterone. That's the sentinel event. So that's why when people have primary dysmenorrhea, usually their periods aren't too bad. It might be heavy, they might be irregular but they don't start becoming painful for several years versus people with secondary dysmenorrhea. Now it's not always the case, but if somebody, if I'm seeing a, a 19 year old who tells me that her periods have been crippling painful since she was 13, I'm much more worried that there could be something else causing that. Right. So you want to rule out fibroids, yeah. PCOS, those things. Well, PCOS doesn't typically cause pain. So it's more endometriosis. And so, yeah. So there are a couple of different ways to approach it. And this is really an individual thing that's always hard to sum up because what you decide really depends on the person sitting in front of you and also what they want to do. So you can start with medications to stop ovulation and to reduce prostaglandins. So you could give non anti-inflammatory medications that would just stop um, or reduce prostaglandins. You could give hormonal contraception you, if you gave the hormonal birth control pill or you gave the Depo-Provera shot, you'd actually stop ovulation. But if you give any of the hormonal contraception with progestins, like the implant, any birth control pill, or the Mirena IUD, the levonorgestrel IUD, you thin out that lining of the uterus. So if there's no lining, you don't produce prostaglandins. So you can control that. You can even give people hormones in such a way they never get a period. So that's one treatment option. Another option would be to look for evidence of endometriosis, maybe with an ultrasound, maybe with an MRI. Whether you need to do that might depend on what you find on exam. It might depend on other factors. And then you can also do surgery to look for endometriosis and then remove it if you see it. And so there's kind of this whole you know, spectrum. Now, we often hear awful stories of how women suffered for 20 years before they were taken seriously. So that spectrum that I gave you shouldn't really take longer than nine months to work through, right? So there isn't a sort of a way if medical algorithms are being followed that this should take longer than a year. Now, I don't want people, pe a, a year can be a long time, but, but you might, someone might say, well, I want to try the birth control pill. Okay, 
that might take you three months, three to four months. How well is that working? Well, it's working a little bit. It's nothing. Maybe I want to try the IUD instead. Um, then maybe I'm getting an MRI. And then maybe, okay, now I'm like five months in. It's not really helping. The MRI doesn't show endometriosis. It doesn't pick it up all the time, but it can be helpful. I want to go ahead and have surgery. Or you could be someone who says, wow, the pill's really helped. I don't want to have surgery. Just to be clear, the pill is stopping ovulation, but the the woman still has her period? Well, so when you're on the birth control pill, you are stopping that sort of hormonal symphony that is causing the uh, egg to develop and the lining to get thick. And you're replacing that with levels that are stable every single day. And what that does is because the progest, so that stops ovulation or most of the time it stops it because the progestin in it, that's the second hormone. It's the progesterone like is so strong on the lining of the uterus. It was designed to be that way. It's very progestogenic to the lining of the uterus. It flattens the lining out. So nothing really develops. And so you get very little lining. So if you stop the birth control pill for seven days, you have withdrawn the hormone progestin. So just like withdrawing progesterone, you'll get some bleeding. But for some people, the lining is so thin because you had those hormones the whole time, you don't get any. And that's okay. And some people decide not to have go off for seven days or for four, three days. And that's okay too. It's totally okay. You can just go straight through and not get a period at all. So some people who have terrible menstrual pain do that and they're like, no period, no pain. I'm great. 